afternoon. It's Wednesday the 31st of May 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host Mike Robinson. Joining me in the studio is Patrick Henningsen. Uh, and we have uh, Alex Thompson joining us um, from the Netherlands as usual for Wednesday. But before we uh, uh, bring Alex onto the programme, we're going to go straight into a little uh, pre-recorded uh, piece of video. Um, on Monday, uh, I was speaking to Anthony Carlin, um, who, if you remember, was the ex-police uh, service Northern Ireland policeman uh, who was fighting Santander over his mortgage. Um, Brian interviewed him about a year ago. Um, I did a short segment with him, and then we're going to bring him on live just to bring you up to date. So let's uh, watch what was recorded on Monday first. So I'd like to welcome Anthony Carlin to the programme. Anthony is the uh, former Police Service Northern Ireland uh, policeman um, who was interviewed by Brian about, oh, about 18 months ago. Um, Anthony, welcome to the programme. Um, just remind us, if you could, uh, what your court case was about and why Brian was interviewing you. I was a serving police officer and, and uh, on my private life, I was getting taken to court with Santander for the repossession of my house. So I basically investigated everything that was going on uh, and, and found all these uh, discrepancies and things that I wasn't happy with, which to my mind was criminal actions. Um, I, I put all of those things in front of the judge, including the document which showed that my mortgage had been paid off twice in full by by a, an anonymous third party to Santander, and that they had suppressed that information and failed to inform the court that those payments even took place. So I put everything to the judge and put him on his oath that he had to do certain things to produce certain documents which would prove my innocence in the court, and he failed to do so. So at that point, I arrested him for five criminal offences. Um, and this, this was related to the securitization of mortgages, is that right? Yes, so my, my mortgage was securitized. That was that was somewhere in the mix there, um, but basically I, I arrested the judge because he failed to, to uphold the law and to do what he was duty bound to do as as a judge, um, and so when I arrested him, I called for police to come, and when the police arrived, they basically ignored everything I had done, which was a complete breach of the, of the code of ethics of police that they have to assist a colleague with an arrest, no matter how unusual. It was for me to document why I arrested him in front of the custody sergeant, but that never never happened. Which was a breach of case. Instead uh, of, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so so that was that was at that point. You'd you'd ended up in prison for a, for a short time, uh, effectively being railroaded uh, on contempt of court charges, uh, and then we interviewed you. Now, just uh, if anybody wants to see that interview, we're going to play it out uh, immediately after this uh, news program uh, on the live stream. So if you haven't seen that interview with Anthony yet, um, stick with us, and you can watch it on the live stream now, Anthony. Uh, that was just over a year ago. Uh, what's happened since then and where are you at yes. today? Well, basically, I, I was dismissed from the job and, and I spent the last year basically going through all the, the, the appeal process. Through, I mean, I spoke to everybody from the, the, police, the, police, the policing board themselves, uh, and the, the police ombudsman, um, everybody that to do with the justice system in Northern Ireland. I was talking to them and engaging with them and they all basically pulled rank and they all said, that on, the, on the 17th of October, you were, you were um, sentenced to jail by the Lord Chief Justice, so we're not listening to anything you say. Um, so um, I, that, that's, that's what's going on for the last year. Um, bottom line was that I was able to produce a criminal record check from the police to show that I have no criminal convictions whatsoever, which negated their, all, all their charges against me, but they still, still weren't found against me. So uh, I've just came to the end of that process now, where again, the, the shutters just came down and, and no one was trying to listen to what I had to say. Um, so, so the bottom line is what, what I found over the past year looking at my case was that I seen judicial corruption being, uh, and collusion of the PSNI, the senior PSNI. Um, so there's corruption and collusion going on with the police and with the judiciary, which brings me up to the, the more recent events that I spoke to you about earlier. Um, but uh, but at the moment they're uh, going for court costs, is that right? Yes, so what's, what's happened recently is my case is back in court where they're trying to repossess my house again. And separate to that, the judge that I arrested has instructed me to give reasons as to why costs shouldn't be given against me for the case in which I arrested him. Right, so, so let me understand this. Uh, the, the, you were put, you arrested the judge, uh, you were put into prison for contempt of court around that arrest, uh, you were sacked from your job but we are here we are 18 months later and they still haven't taken your house but they're still trying to take your house 
Yes. Very right. much so. Okay. Okay. Um, so they're now going for costs as well. Um, and as a result uh, of all the investigations that you've been carrying out over this period of time, you've discovered something quite disturbing, potentially about the judicial process and particularly about the judge. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. So um, basically what's happened is um, um, pe people, people approached me over the last year, because I put my head above the parapet uh, uh, and made allegations against the judiciary, other people have came to me in the meantime saying that they have also suffered at the hands of, of judicial criminality or corruption. Um, and there's one particular story that was put to me with some evidence. It's called the, the Freddie Andrews story. And that's it's covered in detail at www.justbelfast.com. Um, but this uh, this story has been covered extensively in the mainstream mess, press because this is quite a, uh, uh, this is a, a historic case, right? Yeah, so it goes back the last 30 years, since 1976. Uh, it's right up until in the 70s, 80s, 90s and 90s. It finished in 2007 was the, was the last uh, input into the website. But that, that family have just alleged complete corruption by the entire Northern Ireland judiciary. Um, they, they stole all of their property by fraud. Uh, it's an amazing story. It's, it's, uh, it's one of the most notorious stories ever to come out of Northern Ireland. Right, so their allegation is that the judichery was involved in the in the removal of their property. Yes. And, 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 and how does this how does this fit with your case then? Well, I didn't initially see how it did fit with my case. It was just it was just another example of corruption, which 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 I agreed with, but I didn't see that it actually tailored it or t um, came in along with my case until I started looking at it. So what they were saying was there was a house at the centre of that called Tara House, which this family belonged to this family, but the person whose, whose name was on the on the deeds was Freddie Andrews, and he had the mental age of a 10-year-old due to a, a, a botched brain operation that he had as a youngster. So he, in, in law, he wouldn't be able to sign documents and to give permissions to people because he didn't have the mental capacity to do it. In order for him to do that, he would need to have people looking after his welfare as well as his legal his legal interests, uh, and and that, that didn't happen. So, so what did happen was um, a corrupt solicitor was a witness to him signing over his property to a, a senior law society solicitor in Northern Ireland. And that should not have happened to law because the, the law society solicitor was a conflict of interest for someone in the legal profession to benefit from this man. He, he had been placed in the, in the Royal Courts of Justice as a ward of the court to be protected by the courts. And here we have someone, a senior law society a solicitor, buying his house from him and, and what amounts to fraud because he couldn't sign the property across. And who was that senior solicitor? Um, he was Gerald Jeffrey, Gerald Patrick Jeffrey. Okay, and how does, how does that fit in with your case then? So what happened was Gerald Patrick Jeffrey, he, he, bought, he was the purchaser in that agreement and the witness was a man called Herbert Wright. Now Herbert Wright was later the only person to become convicted in relation to the portfolio of the of the Freddie Andrews estate having been plundered and stolen, so there was, was so there was w at least one conviction. So there was acknowledgement uh, within the uh, Northern Irish establishment that there had been wrongdoing here. Yes, but what happened was they they stole the property from Freddie Andrews and they were trying to sell it to another third party, and the third party caught on that this wasn't a, a bona fide uh, transaction, and they took the solicitor to court. So it was, it was on behalf of this company that the, the prosecution came, not the Freddie Andrews family at all. They've never received justice. What happened was, say, Fred, Freddie, Andrew, Freddie Andrews sold the property to Gerald DeGemfrey, and the witness was this crooked solicitor. Okay, So Gerald DeGemfrey, he held onto the property for 10 years. During that 10 years, the matter was being investigated by a PSN or an RUC officer. And, uh, and and for those that don't know, the RUC was the Royal Ulster Constabulary, which is the precursor to the Police Service Northern Ireland. Yes. So this officer, he was a, ve a very good police officer, and he, he cooperated and, and, and contacted the family on a regular basis. And they trusted him, and they understood that he was doing the right for them. But what happened was, he, he, he told members of the press, I think it was the Sunday World, uh, the night before he died, that he was scared for his safety. He was worried about his safety. And the, and the next day he was found on the North Shore in Belfast with his hands tied behind his back and a, and a shot to the back of the head. Um, uh, but, but that was suicide? That was deemed by the coroner in Northern Ireland, who is a judge and who's an arm of the court, to be a suicide. 
uh, and us, I mean, everybody at the time kicked up and said they couldn't believe it, but they said it was an elaborate suicide to make the RUC look bad. Uh, okay, so, so we've got an investigating police officer shot dead under strange circumstances, uh, claimed to be a suicide. Uh, we have a house purchased, uh, held on to for 10 years. What became of the house then? So then what happened was after the police officer had been killed, about eight months after that, then the house was sold by Patrick de Kempery to another party. And who was the other party? The same judge that I arrested last year. So what you're saying is that the house at the centre of an acknowledged fraud case is now in the hands of the judge who who you allege uh, did not handle your case properly and who you attempted to arrest. In fact, you did arrest, but he was rescued by, the, by your colleagues. Um, so that's the same judge. The exact same judge. I couldn't uh, say it was a massive shock to me, but this was the information that I was given and I went and used my PSNI training to investigate this and unearth documents. So I've now come up with two documents for the Freddie Andrews story that have never been seen before, which I've, I've sent over to yourself. Um, um, and, yes, okay, and, and that, was he a judge when he bought the property? No, he was a, um, the documents here, he was, a, he was Queen's Council, he was a QC. He and was and, a and in, your, in your opinion, could it be that he uh, could not have known uh, that this property that he was buying was linked to this fraud case? There's no possible way that that's the case, um, because let's say eight months before that, the police officer that had been investigated had been shot dead in suspicious circumstances. And then six weeks after he bought that, then the, the solicitor, the corrupt solicitor, he was convicted in court of this later offence. Um, so this, this was sandwiched in between. Um, okay, so, but at the very least, you require this judge to recuse himself. Uh, because it seems, aside from anything else, uh, is it normal that, that the same judge would continue through a case uh, in the way that this judge is? Well, I mean, obviously what happened last year was highly unusual happened and in those circumstances he maybe would have recused himself anyway had I asked but I've asked for for him to be recused and for his his judgment against me to be overturned because I don't believe he's a fit and proper person to be sitting as a judge um, if you look at the it's called the Bangalore principles and the judicial conduct um, all, all the all the rules to do with how judges must conduct themselves on and off the job they can't be seen to be involved in any set of circumstances which even would suggest um, unbiased or unethical behaviour on, on behalf of a judge because it would bring the judiciary into disrepute. And he's done this a thousand times over. This is, this is, so, this is on the verge of criminality, if not criminality itself. Um, okay, and then just finally, uh, obviously the, police officer, the policeman who was uh, investigating the original uh, fraud uh, ended up losing his life. Um, are, are you concerned for your own safety in these circumstances? Um, well, I think we're, we're in a different time in Northern Ireland than we were then. Um, but as we've seen there, there was, there was a shooting in Bangor yesterday. A man was shot dead in, in Bangor yesterday to do with the troubles in Northern Ireland. So it still goes on. Will it happen? I, I hope not, and I pray not, and I'm taking precautions. But I wouldn't put anything past them. So that, that's why I'm coming out and I'm saying everything very publicly. Um, I've got grave concerns and, and I want the public at large to know what's actually going on. Okay, so um, I'd like to welcome Anthony to the programme now then. Uh, Anthony, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, now, the reason we recorded that on Monday was because you were in court again yesterday and uh, we didn't <coughs> exactly know what the outcome of that was going to be. Um, so uh, uh, just uh, bring us up to date from, from what we spoke about on Monday then. Uh, yes, so as, a, as in front of uh, Lord, Madam Justice McBride yesterday, uh, and what amounted to, to basically a wholly unfair um, court case, where, where she basically um, just just as I went in, she was awarding possession uh, a possession order to another man before me. Um, again, she found clearly against against the man in favour of the bank, uh, and she wouldn't tell him. He asked simple questions on how he could appeal the case. And she wouldn't give him any guidance or any instructions as what he could do to to continue to protect his property. Um, but that but that court case yesterday wasn't related to the costs. That's a separate court case. So is this is this because they're once yes. again for the third or fourth time now trying to seize your your property? 
Well, yes, they're coming back. It's the second wave of the attack, and there's been numerous cases in relation to it. But in all the six years I've been in court, I have never seen a judge display behaviour like she did yesterday. She was highly unfair. She was clearly biased. Um, she was obviously siding with the plaintiff. Um, she in, she interrupted me throughout proceedings and, and failed to allow me to present my defence in the way that I was comfortable doing. Uh, she was um, she obstructed me. At one point, she ridiculed me and asked, did, did I want her to come down and sit beside me in the dock so that she could give me instructions on what to do? Uh, it, was, it was awful how, how she treated me. Um, okay, so, uh, well, look, um, that, that continues. Uh, when, when do you hear more about the, the cost hearing? Because actually there may not be a hearing, is that right? Um, well, well, the cost hearing, the, the cost hearing was a separate matter that's basically curtailed from last year. So the judge that I arrested, I think wisely, has decided to deal with it by, uh, on paper, uh, emails back and forth to the court rather than have another hearing. Um, but I, I've put in a complaint in relation to him not being a fit and proper person to preside over these proceedings for the reasons in the video. Um, and I've asked for him to, to be struck off the, or to be recused from the case and for my, um, my, my case to be overturned to his judgment. Um, now, the case that you mentioned uh, in that little piece that we did there, um, that did get quite extensive mainstream media coverage uh, over the last uh, 30 years. Um, but it's, there hasn't been much about it in the last 10 years or so. Um, so uh, you, but you're in contact with that family and, and, and working with them now, is that right? Yes, I've, I've got their full permission to, to, to put this back into the public domain uh, and to share the Freddie Andrews story, um, which is the most notorious story in Northern Ireland. But yeah, I've got their full support, yes. Okay. Okay, well, Anthony, thank you for joining us. Just a smart, short segment, uh, live segment with you, but uh, th that brings everybody up to date and, and we will do deal with the uh, Freddie Andrews case in more detail in the not too distant future. Now, for anybody that wants to uh, find out more about this, as I said in the pre-recorded piece, uh, we will be playing out uh, the uh, Brian's interview with uh, Anthony just straight after this news programme. Uh, but also, uh, Anthony, people can uh, find you on your Facebook. Is this a group or a page? It's just my own personal page. I'm trying to keep my bank fighting activity uh, separate to my family. So I've started a page that anybody can go on to, which is separate from my own profile, you know, just to keep that separate. Okay, super. And uh, and the, there uh, was an event, uh, there is an event coming up uh, dealing with this issue of fraudulent mortgages. Uh, give us the details yes. on that. Um, yes, it's basically, it's uh, www.clearyourmortgage.co.uk. It's, it's a group that's coming out now and effectively they're, they're trying to uh, make securitization of mortgages the new PPA. So there's an event coming up on the, the 8th of June that I'm speaking at in, in central Birmingham. So they can go onto that website. Uh, I don't know if you're able to put up the photograph there, but um, it's clearmortgage.co.uk uh, uh, for information. Yeah, we, we have a little ad section later on. We'll bring we'll bring that slide up then. Yeah. Okay, Anthony, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be in touch, and uh, as I say, we'll be doing more on uh, the Andrews case as well. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's move on then. And uh, Alex, um, this article from Foreign Affairs magazine, complete change of subject, uh, or perhaps not. Uh, World Order 2.0 is the headline, the case for sovereign obligation. And really, of course, at the heart of this article is the issue of rights and obligations. Uh, and this is by Richard N. Haas. Uh, he says that uh, for nearly four centuries since the Peace of Westphalia, which ended the Thirty Years' War, the concept of sovereignty, the right of nations, to an independent existence and autonomy has occupied the core of what international order there has been. Uh, this made sense, for as every century, including the current one, has witnessed a world in which borders are forcibly violated is a world of instability and conflict. But an approach to international order premised solely on respect for sovereignty, uh, together with the maintenance of balance of power necessary to secure it, is no longer sufficient. The globe's traditional operating system, call it World Order 1.0, has been built around the protection and prerogatives of states. Uh, it is increasingly inadequate in today's globalised world. Little now stays local. Just about anyone and anything from tourists, terrorists and refugees to emails, diseases, dollars and greenhouse gases can reach almost anywhere. The result is what goes on inside a country can no longer be considered the concern of the country alone. Today, circumstances call for an updated operating system, call it World Order 2.0, that includes not only the rights of sovereign states, 
but also those states' obligations to others. So what Haas seems to be saying here, Alex, as far as I can see, uh, is that uh, um, just as we're being told as individuals that we only get our human rights, forget God-given rights, we only get our human rights if we meet our obligations to the state, uh, Haas seems to be saying that states only get their rights of sovereignty if they meet their obligations. And the first question in my mind, Alex, is who are these obligations to? Well, ultimately, they would be to Haas's own people. If you recall the recent appearance uh, of Mark Anderson of American Free Press, who is the expert on the Bilderberg Group and the Council on Foreign Relations, CFR, which is for, on whose behalf Richard Haas writes, uh, the Chicago Club of Globalists, basically, who have an access to London and New York, um, they are they regard themselves, the, the great industrialists of the world or of the West, as uh, the rightful heirs of the planet, the planetary fiefdom, as some people call it, um, such as Ike. And so Haas is saying, really, just like individuals have been schooled for a couple of, uh, of generations now in post-libertarian, uh, post-liberty ideas that, uh, you know, we decide when you get your rights, um, you first you must live up to your responsibilities or we'll pl pull the plug on you as an individual financially or in your health and your food. Uh, so the same is being threatened on entire nations now. And it's one of the signs that the Bilderberg Group actually uh, is on the back foot now. There's a number of indications of that. Uh, besides this, uh, this piece, which sounds ominous, but is actually the Bilderbergers showing that they're quietly desperate, uh, we have more examples of that. For example, if you go to that AmericanFreePress.net site, Mark Anderson's site, he does a brilliant interview with Daniel Estulin. If you just look for New Movie Exposes Bilderberg on AmericanFreePress.net, you'll find it. Listen very carefully to this high-level interview because Estulin, who together with Anderson is the expert on Bilderberg in the free media, they're saying, well, actually, these old money guys in Europe are panicking. They have wrecked two uh, financial and economic systems since the Peace of West failure. If you want to know what that is, look at the British Constitution Group talk I gave in Winchester. And because of this sovereign system of states, the money men have not had unfettered global access and they very much dearly wish to have it because their own model is burned out, at least in the Western economies. And they're, they're wanting desperately to persuade the rest of the world, the developing world, to join their system. But no one's being persuaded. So there seems to be several indications of wrestling going on within uh, the global elite or the Western elite as to what model to pursue, which is a good sign. They're not all on the same side. There's division among them. Uh, well, indeed. So, look, uh, let's remind ourselves what the first clause of the Peace of Westphalia said, because this really was the basis of uh, modern nation states. Uh, that there should be a Christian and universal peace and a perpetual, true and sincere amity, that this peace and amity be observed and cultivated with such sincerity and zeal that each party shall endeavour to procure the benefit, honour and advantage of the other, and thus that on all sides they may see, a peace, see this peace and friendship flourish by entertaining a good and faithful neighbourhood. And Alex, that always seemed like a pretty good basis for a foreign policy to me. Absolutely. It worked extremely well and it capped off a period of centuries of internecine strife in Europe. And uh, Patrick's in the studio today. Um, the, the very nation of the United States uh, could never have been formed without the peace of Westphalia because it allowed the best of Europeans to cooperate and compete friend on a friendly basis, peaceful basis, uh, both in Europe and in the uh, New World. Uh, and without that idea, uh, great nations and economies would not have been formed since that period. But of course, it's not in the interest of the peak people, uh, whether, whether you call them capitalists or decry them more specifically as, as corporatists or whatever, it's not in their interests for us all to be free and prosperous. Um, but uh, I wanted to sort of compare what the Peace of Westphalia says, what uh, President Xi Jinping said a couple of years ago. History tells us that the law of the jungle isn't the way of human coexistence. Every nation should obey the principle of equality, mutual trust, learning from each other, cooperating and seeking joint benefits for the construction of a harmonious world, sustained peace and joint prosperity. And it seemed to me at that time that he was absolutely echoing the sentiments of uh, the Peace of Westphalia. Um, is, is this that, that, in your view, and I'm going to ask Patrick the same question, is this that uh, she is, is, has a genuinely different view of how uh, the world should work uh, compared to the Bilderberg types, the, these Western internationalists? Or is he just catching the same globalization in in different language? Well, the communist Chinese are not to be trusted in the end. Um, our forefathers of the Cold War were quite right about that. Uh, there is some kind of Eurasian alliance developing. It has various acronyms, the Collective Shanghai Treaty Organization, the Eurasian Economic Community and so on. 
But the Russians and Chinese are not easy bedfellows, let alone when you try to stick the Germans in. Uh, they're all at each other's throats. They have uh, incompatible worldviews. And besides that, the communist Chinese have been a laboratory for Western Marxism uh, to test out the kind of po total population control online and in, in the in economy that they wish to, ex uh, to unleash on the West, particularly driven by the Washington State Department and the London think tanks. So she is not to be trusted, but he is riding a wave as Putin is in Russia and Merkel even in Germany now, a wave of, uh, of sentiment in these great Eurasian countries, which is uh, it's time to be done with uh, Anglo-Saxon hegemony and forge our own model. And part of that, as uh, Bernice Bartels is uh, writing both on our own website and also at her own blog spot at Global Citizen News, uh, if you look for her uh, recent uh, piece on that, which is called... Um, new digital ID and gold on the blockchain. She's pointing out that all the gold is held in the East uh, and now all the West, Western elites can do is invent blockchain technology driven by people like Blythe Masters, the, man, the woman who uh, uh, arguably ruined the economy with her credit default swap ideas. She's very big on blockchains. All these, these people are basically desperately trying to hold the reins of the Eurasian economy by saying, okay, well, we'll at least, we don't have any gold anymore in our vaults, but we'll at least uh, uh, administer it on computers for you. So that there's a very complicated power, uh, power play going on, but uh, all the cards are in the East's hands because the, uh, the precious metals and the productivity is there. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I just go back to the original article which started this conversation uh, by Richard uh, Haas mm. and from the Council on Foreign Relations. The two reasons that he gave which uh, to to discredit his case to discredit the modern nation state were the, uh, the borders being violated, nation state borders being violated. And the other was uh, he mentioned greenhouse gases, which was a, a sort of a look into global governance um, a la uh, the uh, COP21 uh, or the Paris Climate Agreement, that sort of global uh, global governance idea. And so that's, you know, the whole idea, firstly, of greenhouse gases is, uh, is, is very debatable in scientific circles, okay? So that's the one. But violating borders of nation states, who is the most egregious violator of borders of nation states? Uh, they have to be NATO member states. Uh, look at, well, look at what Turkey did in Syria recently. Look at the United States has in effect effectively also invaded Syria, a number of other countries, look at Libya, uh, look at so many other examples. So the biggest violator of other people's borders in a violent fashion are NATO member states led by the United States. And this is where Richard Haas is from. He's, and he served in those administrations. So how is he to lecture uh, anybody? And, and so again, the, the U.S. And is, is leading the problem creation. And so then they manage the reaction, and here he's providing the solution. Hmm. So, you know, a thesis, antithesis. Yeah. So there we are. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to apologize to Anthony for not having this, uh, this slide in the right order. Uh, but this is the event that he was talking about, uh, the Mortgage Compensation Seminar. Uh, go to uh, SIM events, SIM events, C Y M E V E N T S dot co dot UK for details on that. Uh, 8th of June, uh, 6 to 7 p.m. in Birmingham, five ways. So that's that. And then um, 11th of June at 7 p.m. in the Cheese and Grain and Froom, you, Vanessa, uh, Peter... Um, Peter Ford. Ford, thank you. Yeah. Uh, apologies, Peter. Uh, Robert Stewart, Professor Piers Robinson, Professor Tim Hayward uh, speaking at that event. Do get along to it if you can. Um, right, now... Spiegel, Alex, I'm kind of dropping this on you because you may not have seen this, but Spiegel Online uh, has published this article, It's Time to Get Rid of Donald Trump. Uh, and uh, they're basically, well, I mean, how do you read this headline, Patrick? Well, they're inferring assassination, I guess. Absolutely. That's not the first time. So. Uh, that's right. So we've got to get rid of him. Uh, and uh, they're, they're saying that he's a danger to the world. Uh, one of the media's tasks is continue telling things as they are. Trump has to be removed from the White House quickly. He is a danger to the world. Why? Other than a string of personal insults. Trump's crime is that he doesn't play ball. Uh, and uh, so nothing is regulated, nothing is stable, and the transatlantic relationship hardly exists anymore. Total hysteria. Total hysteria. Yeah, just liberal hysteria on, on uh, completely on steroids. Uh, Alex, uh, I mean, is this typical of Spiegel? Spiegel gets pretty outrageous at times, it has to be said. It's the, the, the flagship of the, uh, what, what could we call it, um, triumphalist uh, lefty media that's dominated Germany since the war. But uh, again, 
uh, whether we see German plots everywhere or not, and there, there are such things uh, because the Germans are an impetuous lot, there's always Anglo-American scheming behind them. You can't give the Germans all the blame. And uh, particularly the Germans' natural tendency, which they're well aware of by, by now, actually, to, to go uh, hell for leather on things and to, to try to foist their um, export goods on people, much like the Chinese do. Um, that, that tendency tends to be held in check by the better Germans themselves. They're always wrestling with their own demons. And that's a line that was used actually on a, a crosstalk uh, half hour episode on RT, which I'd warmly recommend, uh, which appeared just yesterday, I believe, uh, in which Ralph Niemeyer, uh, this uh, independent left wing uh, German thinker of great moral integrity, pointed this out, actually. It, uh, it has to do with the, uh, the obsolescence of NATO, in which he says, you know, the Germans are quite right to say, uh, the Germans point out rather that Trump's quite right to say no, so NATO is obsolete. But why did he have such a slanging match, Trump, with Mrs. Merkel at the G7? Uh, well, we're having to read the runes here, but it looks very much like Merkel said, we must have a strong European military, uh, and uh, Trump's with her on that, of course. He, but he, he just hears the, the dollar signs, doesn't the, the dollar bills ringing up, you know, you pay your, your dues, because he's not into the geopolitics of it. But what she means, of course, is we must have that to continue to, foisting, to foist our goods on Africa and Russia, you know, a kind of gunboat diplomacy, again, like the Chinese. And it's uh, the Germans and other Germanic continental countries like to ride on the coattails of more gung-ho countries like Britain and America usually, but they very much enjoy the cover. And now we're backing away from them, both Trump and Britain, uh, America and Britain with Trump and Brexit, uh, at least the popular mood is. The Germans are having to uh, co-opt the entire European uh, army, which you're going to uh, cover later in the program. So that's what's behind this, that, that the, uh, the dominant note in the German elite is very hacked off with Trump for having to make them against their own inclinations, bare their own teeth and say, OK, we're actually going to be German hegemons now. I mean, a Dutch newspaper this week said uh, that uh, if there was any lingering doubt as to who was top of the monkey pride uh, in Europe, Mrs. Merkel, with her uh, post G7 speech, has shown that she's top gorilla. You know, that's uh, that's the kind of thinking that even the Dutch and the Danes have realised now. Uh, that's uh, that's pretty good language. Um, OK, well, let's move on to Syria then. And uh, uh, Sergei Lavrov here, according to TASS, uh, well, the headline in TASS is Moscow concerned over U.S. threats against Syrian armed forces. Uh, and, uh, well, what did he actually say? He said, I believe this situation is rather alarming as it directly affects Syria's sovereignty. Certainly these issues need to be solved and tr our troops are doing this now. So, of course, they're talking about the issue of, of ISIS in Syria and so on. Uh, he uh, said that, uh, uh, that the effort, that, sorry, the effort to deconflict uh, the, uh, and the, the discussions with the U.S. regarding that are now uh, are being, sorry, there are discussions going on over that, but it's not enough. And, and he said, but of course, the uh, effort uh, would be much more efficient if in addition to that channel of communications, uh, which is rather limited agenda, the U.S. agreed to join the work in coordinating parameters uh, of de-escalation de zones. We're ready to welcome the United States joining not only the attempts to avoid incidents, but also to work uh, to define de-escalation zones further. So, uh, again, Lavrov offering something to the United States and the United States not really seeming to want to play ball. Yeah, this is, the, this is simple, actually basic uh, political 101 tactics. You could probably even read it in Saul Alinsky's uh, book. He's forcing the other side to live up to their standards of diplomacy or their standards of international moral uh, uh, norms, mm -hmm. as it were and cooperation and international law, all the things that the United States and its allies, including the UK and France, have been routinely flouting uh, since the beginning of the Syrian war. So, I mean, Russia's just playing it by the book, Mike. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look back, that's all they've been doing pretty much since the, since the beginning of this uh, conflict in Syria. They've absolutely played it by the book. And the other side has been cheating, scheming, breaking, uh, disrupting, undermining, and sabotaging. So. What more can we say? Uh, well, indeed, and as Lavrov pointed out, they are the only ones uh, dealing with the issue of ISIS in Syria at the moment. Here's another example. So they have announced uh, that a, a warship and a submarine fired cruise missiles at Islamic State, not at Syrian infrastructure, not at uh, uh, Syrian army, just at ISIS. Not schools and hospitals. Not schools and hospitals, absolutely. Uh, and uh, so uh, this, this has apparently hit... Uh, targets close to Palmyra, uh, and that seems to be the main uh, area of activity at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the strategically, Palmyra is like the hub um, just south of Deir ez -Zor. 
it's where um, uh, strategically uh, so many things are coming together, and obviously this is a good place to break ISIS, vice versa for those who are supporting ISIS. Palmyra is a good place to break Syria mm. and to break Syria's uh, uh, military coalition with Russia. Um, okay, let's move on to Manchester. Uh, and uh, Alex, Peter Hitchens, uh, this is from a few days ago now, but he's saying, uh, put away your pointless troops, Prime Minister. Uh, only beat bobbies can stop terror. Yes, it's one of those emperor's new clothes moments, isn't it? When uh, a grand old man of British journalism who's been through all the parties and got jaded with all of them says, but why do we have troops in camouflage meant to protect them in forests on the streets of London? Mm -hmm. What possible military purpose does that serve or security aim? None at all. It's uh, I mean, just uh, this morning, the Scottish Review uh, launched its weekly update. And you have Kenneth Roy there, who used to be BBC Scotland's uh, front man. Uh, on the news, saying that uh, the politicians want us in a state of fear and alarm. Another one of his junior writers uh, saying that the British press is fostering uh, a culture of terror. And uh, Hitchens has realised this. He's saying, well, if you don't have policemen on patrol, you will not spot the early signs of radicalisation and weapons or, or uh, of bomb making. Uh, what can a, a man or woman with an SA-80 in forest camouflage do in Westminster? Yeah. Really just mop up the pieces. Uh, ab absolutely. It's a, com it's, it, a lot of people have been saying this in America too, Mike. This is, it's a law enforcement issue. I'm sorry, any way you cut it, a, a, a crime is a crime, whether it's terrorism, murder, or theft in any country. And the, the people best suited to deal with crime are law enforcement, police, uh, frontline uh, uh, civil uh, constables and so forth. But this is this is common is, sense. This is absolutely correct. Uh, but of course, uh, let me just remind uh, where this has come from. This policy, to my knowledge, the first time I saw this policy openly discussed, this policy of merging civilian and police, sorry, civilian and military infrastructures, uh, was from Federica Mogherini at the European Defence Agency conference in November 2015. Uh, she was absolutely calling for that. We've covered this several times. Uh, subsequently, as news came out, for example, uh, NATO uh, deploying uh, non-lethal weapons to uh, NATO staff. And you've got to ask, well, what kind of role are NATO going to be fulfilling on, if they're receiving so-called non-lethal weapons, um, rubber bullets and so on, right? Policing. P a policing role. So, so between NATO and the European Union, we're seeing this move to merge these two uh, forms of institution. And as you've pointed out a couple of days ago, of course, on the European continent, they have a much more of a militarized structure, to, but it's still civilian police. Even if it's a militarized civilian police, it's still civilian police. What's going on here and what was demonstrated uh, following Manchester was something quite different, where military personnel were being put under the command and control of Cressida Dick. I mean, come on. So that's a situation that's somewhat different uh, and and particularly dangerous and worrying. Now, they've pulled back from that now, but they've now set the precedent. It's all predicated on the idea that uh, the police just can't handle it. It's too much. So they put out fake statistics like uh, we are looking at uh, X amount of 23,000 terrorists uh, running amok in Britain. You know, so it, it inflated statistics based on sort of hyperbole. Uh, and so what are the real numbers? Well, ask the police what the real numbers are, and I think you'll find they're much lower in terms of specifics. Um, Alex, do you have any thoughts on, on why uh, Mogherini and Stoltenberg are pushing this policy of merging civilian and military uh, institutions? You could take the line of saying that it's uh, a, a means of just keeping the population cowed, but it also allows for blurring of funding, as in the United States, actually, and the United States aid to foreign militaries, where there are rules about what the Pentagon can do to train foreigners and what the US uh, police or other law enforcers can do. Uh, it allows, uh, if, if there's one type of person, like a military person under police command or vice versa, you've got sufficient blurring to be able to send anyone on any operations anywhere and for temporary and extraordinary help as with NATO Article 5, uh, although that tends to refer to airframes and so on, but the same concept, you can draft people in so that eventually you're being soldiered by Romanians on the streets of London as a temporary measure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely. A way, because it's done by a treaty, it's a way of circumventing our, uh, our standing uh, requirements and our constitutional and statutory limitations. Okay, well, sticking with uh, Manchester, we've got this headline from the Metro. Survivor of 7-7 found dead after Manchester bombing because he didn't want to live in a world of terror attacks. Both you and Patrick uh, asked for this to be put in. Uh, Alex, so, so let me uh, hear your thoughts on the story first. 
poor Tony Walter, who was 52 when he took his own life, um, he was uh, often called the um, um, the most outspoken, uh, at least in his testimony uh, in the 2005 uh, inquest. He, he was the most, most outspoken of the survivors. And Nick Collistrom in Terror on the Tube picked up on the fact that he very honestly testified that being bombed, apparently by a chap using uh, a shrapnel uh, rucksack device, uh, that the feeling of, of being subjected to this was like being, quote, electrocuted from the feet up. One of several indications that not the only thing going on there was a bomb at uh, waist height going off from a rucksack. I mean, I was uh, inside, as it were, on the inside at the time, covering these very attacks and the, the response to them. And uh, for months, uh, I was only seeing the footage that MI5 wanted me to see of that, really, and not finding out about what the survivors had said. And I think one of the elements in this may have been uh, the, the poor man's realisation that, as well as the very real uh, Islamist extremist uh, wave that uh, that caused the attacks, there was a lot of connivance, at the very least, going on. Patrick? Sure. When I saw this uh, story, I thought, wow, how bizarre. So the story claims uh, that the person committed suicide hours after the attack. So this would have been uh, on the evening, Monday evening or you know, early in the morning on Tuesday because he just couldn't bear to live anymore in a world of terrorist attacks. And they specifically said this uh, Westminster had set him off and then this had finished him off in Manchester. And you go in and it says the article in The Independent ran the, uh, the Mirror story. So this was basically syndicated uh, through a number of mainstream outlets and said, friends say, friends say, his friends claim. And you go and read a little closer, and I thought, where did this story come from? And I trace it back, and it turns out it originated in the sun. So, in, so an unnamed friend, singular friend, told the sun that he committed suicide uh, because it reminded him of 7-7 Manchester. All that's is happening within a period of hours, okay? Because you have to remember, the Manchester was late at night mm -hmm. when the story came. So if it was hours after the Manchester attack, then his friend, unnamed friend, would have had to know that he was going to top himself uh, because of Manchester within those, those few hours. And it's an unnamed friend. So why are they saying friends say, plural, and then you find out they don't even name the person who gave this information to the son? It just seems to me like a tabloid story, Mike, that quite possibly, like many stories, and let's be honest, many stories in tabloids that are inflated and misleading and in some cases could be classed as disinformation and fake news. Okay, I'm not saying that I know that this is fake news, but I am saying that it looks, it, it, this story has been respun by the independent. And, you know, look at the independent, it doesn't even have a newspaper anymore. It's basically an online blog, uh, which is masquerading as a news outlet now. And so they've respun something out of the sun. This is where the independent is as a news organization. Yeah. And so I, I just say people should ask questions about the stuff they're reading in the paper. I personally don't think uh, this story is uh, watertight. I think it. I have questions about this story. And, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, Alex the Duran and uh, how Britain's how the British deep state turned Manchester into Al Qaeda town, UK. Well, the areas just south of Manchester city centre, which were of concern with the Libyans coming in, are the same parts, Longsight and the like, uh, just south of Mossai, just south of the, the, the Black Yardi gang areas, basically. Uh, these these Arab Libyan areas um, were the same ones that we were watching uh, around the time after 9-11 and after 7-7, so, uh, and all the things in between, like the supposed rice in plot. So uh, there's, there's a kind of safe neighbourhood there where we were... Uh, as a state, particularly, I think, elements of the security services were fostering uh, these chaps. Uh, for example, uh, in this case, it's the LIFG, Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. We were long opposed to Gaddafi, kind of tribal Berbers. And uh, it's just the same with uh, the, the long-term plan to take down Iran. There's been a very inter uh, high interest by Israel and the West in supporting Mujahideen al-Khalq, which is an, you know, an, an anti-Tehran uh, or anti-Shia regime uh, group. Uh, and the kinds of intelligence that we have been uh, producing on these guys for decades, or the, the, the people who are interested in consuming that intelligence, uh, are a very different group of people than would be interested in looking at the threat, threat from Al-Qaeda, for example. Um, they seem to have been kept keeping a watching brief on these tame terrorists for decades. And in that article there in the Duran, uh, one Ziad Hashim says, when the Libyan revolution started, that's the revolution which uh, deposed Gaddafi and ended with him being killed in horrible ways, uh, Hashim says things changed then in Britain. Their way there, he means the authorities, their way of speaking to me and treating me was different. They offered to give me benefits, even ILR, indefinite leave to remain, or citizenship. 
And of course, the article finishes by saying Gaddafi warned that uh, après moi le déluge, you know, all these uh, blackened and Arab terrorists would come into Britain and Europe through uh, that route, both the smuggling and the ideological support. And it happened. Um, when I was uh, looking at the, because obviously there were these allegations that MI6 was involved with uh, the, the, this uh, Libyan group and the family of the young man that was alleged to have done this thing in Manchester. Um, when I was looking into that, Alex, uh, and looking at historic uh, newspaper reports on this, for example, I think it was uh, the Guardian in, in 2011 carried something where, where there was a, an absolutely definitive denial from the British government that MI6 and this Libyan group were, were in any way linked. Um, I'm not aware that this is something that, uh, as a matter of course, the government does. I, I, I assume that on, on intelligence issues, they simply did not comment. Uh, and therefore, a, a denial, an outright denial, is something unusual, and perhaps we should take note of that. You're absolutely right there, Mike. The usual policy is NCND, neither confirm nor deny. That wording is often used. We neither confirm nor deny special forces operations, GCHQ operations, for example. Uh, for it to be pointed and a, a, a specific no, well, a specific denial is a general admission. That's what is being got at by the question happened. But if you add some adverbial clauses in, for example, Colonel Mustard did not kill her with the candlestick in the dining room, then you're only denying one specific combination of allegations and not the, the general thrust of what's being advised. And this, this seems to me not just a British problem with rogue elements in the security services, but also our continental allies. Uh, a viewer from southern Sweden has sent me something from SVT Nyheter today uh, in which uh, an, an, an inquiry uh, by the remaining sort of non-far left outfits in Sweden and Denmark, Sveriges Radio, Danmarks Radio and Jyllandsposten, the famous uh, newspaper in Jutland, they have found that uh, Sweden and Denmark have been swindled out of the equivalent of nine or ten million euros or pounds in, in crowns in those currencies, the equivalent, by VAT fraud, uh, often involving electronic goods sales, the usual carousel, uh, or by fake businesses that went bust. And under the noses of the most stringent and highly taxing regimes in the world, let alone in Europe, Sweden and Denmark have apparently let this happen. These are the same countries which, together with Britain and the Netherlands, have uh, bunged money hand over fist to the white helmets. Uh, and sorry, the, the point was that this VAT fraud has gone to benefit ISIS. So yeah. uh, a lot of this is going on. Yeah, um, well, uh, Paddy Ashdown then uh, is in the news, Guardian and others covering this. Uh, Paddy Ashdown horrified by parallels between UK and 1930s Germany. Let's see what he had to say. We are the only advanced democracy in the world in which the leader of our nation can get away with not turning up to have a proper debate with the opposition. I think it's as extraordinary that we don't seem to be kicking up a fuss about it. Uh, but was he merely talking about the, uh, the, the fact that uh, there isn't a television, proper television debate over the election or was he referring to uh, the pretty draconian uh, security uh, implications following Manchester? One would hope the latter, Mike, uh, if he's got any libertarian, or, or I shouldn't use that word narrowly, if he's got any sentiments for liberty and, and, uh, uh, and the rule of law. But uh, despite his uh, military background and, and uh, often about patriotism, uh, he's got other interests, as your credits on screen said there, with uh, being basically Viceroy of Kosovo. And um, so I, I don't really trust what he's saying. Uh, he seemed to enjoy it when his Liberal Democrat Party was the minor uh, party in, in the coalition uh, in the last parliament up to 2015. And there was no accountability there given either. I think he's just miffed that in marginal Tory Lib Dem constituencies, his people are not going to get a, a go. And particularly at, at party leadership level, his beloved Tim Farron isn't going to have a ding dong with Theresa May, in which, I mean, even the weak Tim Farron would probably outperform May because she's such a wooden performer. But this is one of the aspects of our non-election, which uh, rather confuses people. There, there is no debate and there's no leadership. Yeah, to, to, uh, I might add that uh, Patty Ashdown's party, if it wasn't for the Liberal Democrats, that this party in power now would not be in power, probably. Yeah. Uh, so maybe he's just making up, trying to make up for that um, original sin, as it were. Quite possibly, right? Okay. Well, look, uh, Alex. As usual, we're rapidly running out of time, so let's uh, let's see if we can get through a couple of this. Uh, Netherlands doesn't have a government at the moment. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, in Belgium, they've gone almost a year before or longer uh, in two periods in the 90s and recently without a government. But that's because of squabbles between the French and Dutch speakers largely over the budget and so on. But here, the Netherlands always has some time to thrash out a coalition because they have two or three versions of every kind of party, two or three Tory parties, two or three Labour parties, two or three Green parties, two or three Lib Dem parties. And all of these have to get together. But the, sign, um, the signs are, are that there's a complete impasse here. Uh, the equivalent of the Lib Dems, D66, are so anti-Christian, they won't have any party 
party and coalition that has Christian in its name. And uh, the, the suggestion by the lady you just had on screen, Mr. Schippers, who's trying to form a government, uh, at least by negotiating in the continental model, she has now submitted a report to the king uh, suggesting that a, a, a has-been old senator from the Labour Party called Cherk Vilink, Cenk Vilink should be appointed the new formateur as, they, formateur, as they call him, to form the government, which has gone down very hard with most parties because the Labour Party hemorrhaged down to nine seats in Parliament. Uh, so it's a reward for bad performance, really, jobs for the boys. And there's a desperate attempt to keep the uh, conservative, Christian and any kind of constitutionalist element out of government. Um, so well, we now know that while uh, Parliament is dissolved in this country, government still exists and, and the, the uh, Prime Minister and the Ministers of State uh, maintain those positions, even though they're no longer MPs. Uh, how does that work in Holland? What, or is it just all handed over to the civil service to, to maintain things running? No, it's done more formally even than the British model. The French and every country whose government's based on the French, including Benelux, have the word have a word for this. They call the ministers in that situation demissionnaire. So they have been demissioned, uh, but they still have their old brief. So they continue to run their departments. And that can go on for over a year in the case of Belgium. So there will be government without parliamentary... Well, we have parliamentary scrutiny because parliament's convened here in the Netherlands again. But what you don't have is a regular cabinet to hold the uh, the ministers to account or the, uh, the departments. So if a particular ministry wants to fund white helmet type activity or uh, hand over a couple of battalions to the Germans uh, or other things that we seem to do a lot in the Netherlands, then there's no accountability. I see. Right. So, right. That's very interesting. OK. Uh, and in, what's going on in, Ger in Germany then? Uh, the, the French business paper Les Echos is, has uh, had a series of articles on how pro-German Macron's people are because they regard Germany as the motor of German, of European economy. And now they're dischuffed with Britain, which they used to call the, uh, the, you know, the, the free market model to follow. So uh, a lot of the, the individuals named in this report uh, in, are actually, uh, as who are new ministers, are pro-German, speak German, follow German models. Uh, apparently, they're, they're ready to take German orders. There's a particular push to make an energy union. Uh, on the Franco-German axis, the next stage beyond the military union. And that seems to be a, a flagship policy that Macron's ministers are going to implement to tie France uh, even more closely into Germany than the Coal and Steel Pact did. Um, but uh, uh, Poland, it seems, isn't quite so willing to uh, to take on this, this German authority. Uh, so what's, uh, what's Beata saying? Beata Szydło appeared to speak in the Polish parliament the same uh, on a motion of no confidence, which the opposition uh, had, uh, who, who want to see limitless immigration effectively, they, they had served a motion uh, of no confidence in the Polish defence minister from Beata's party, Prawość Prawodliwość, Law and Security, uh, Law and Justice, I beg your pardon, uh, because they didn't like the way that the defence minister was doing his job properly. So as you see here, she's getting a standing ovation when she's saying, well, we're, we're never going to compromise on the security of Polish children. We're never going to have terrorists into uh, routine in Poland. And as she's saying at this point, uh, she's saying to the opposition, if you can't see that uh, a, a, a allowing uh, unfettered immigration and deliberately not checking the immigrants is a problem, then you are in fact an ally of those who are causing the terror, which is a, a point which could well be made in Western Europe. And she says you're walking hand in hand, as the subtitle is about to say, um, with those who are actually committing the terrorist offence. Now, uh, at this point, she got uh, heckled by the opposition, cries of shame, shame. But she also got people, not just her own party either, but anyone who's not a, a far Marxist, saying, yes, this is absolutely right. OK, well, let's move on then to uh, EU military. And uh, this is the uh, the Centre for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, which is a Washington-based think tank, uh, complaining bitterly that, uh, that Britain's uh, military has been cut uh, that it uh, would struggle to sustain more than six and a half thousand troops in a future conflict. Uh, and uh, But of course, what the report uh, doesn't do is uh, explain why this has happened. Um, so I just wanted to briefly uh, remind everybody to uh, keep an eye on, uh, on this page, the EU military unification page on the UK Column website. We have a timeline of uh, EU military unification. EU military unification is the reason why Britain's military is being cut in the way that it is, because uh, if you look at, we've said this before, if you look at the various strategic uh, defence reviews, uh, they, are, uh, they are developed in such a way that, that uh, the interdependence between national militaries all fits together um, on, on an EU level. Um, so keep an eye on that. The timeline will be updated as new events uh, 
uh, new events take place and please share this as much as possible because you can't really understand what's going on uh, with the cuts to the uh, British military unless you understand EU military into, uh, unification. Um, Patrick, we've got a few minutes. Let's talk about uh, AI. Let's talk about Stephen Fry and okay. AI. Those two terms that you don't normally see. Are they synonymous? They, you don't normally see them next to each other, but some people believe that Stephen Fry is AI. But uh, So this is, a, this is an article by the Daily Mail, a paragon of news and journalism by many people's standards, allegedly. But uh, So Stephen Fry says in this Daily Mail article, we must prepare for the advances of AI, artificial intelligence. And uh, so Stephen Fry has warned uh, that we should prepare for a dystopian uh, nightmare of an existence somehow we're not ready for this I can't think of any more of a dystopian nightmare Mike than uh, seeing the tweets of Stephen Fry uh, fly off Twitter by every every few seconds but anyway so he criticizes technophobes and politicians for being too slow to the uh, advances of technology etc this is a sort of trope you have to imagine him talking to the Hay Festival somewhere in Wales uh, talking to all these Guardian editors and uh, left-wing intelligentsia when he's giving this uh, great sort of eulogy for the, uh, the, the internet. Anyway, so his remarks came uh, the same week Facebook uh, was accused of dragging their feet uh, for the circulation of what they call sick videos and terror manuals um, on the website. So, so basically if we advance, we advance a little further in this story and we find out that uh, this isn't just a news story about Stephen Fry warning us about AI. Um, we dig a little deeper and we find that this is actually, it, this article morphs into a promotion for the conservative manifesto. This is amazing. So Theresa May called on technology firms to realize uh, that they have a social responsibility to remove harmful content from the internet. And so the conservative manifesto vows to crack down on social media, crack down and uh, on sites to protect the vulnerable uh, and give people confidence to use the internet without fear of abuse <laughs> and bullying and criminality and all these things. So, so they've used Stephen Fry, and this is uh, the, the point of this I'm showing, Mike. This is a Daily Mail article. So they've used Stephen Fry as the bait, and it draws people in. And then what do they lead them to? Down a, cold, a conservative Tory cul-de-sac campaigning. So this is the Daily Mail campaigning for the conservative party. For Theresa May using Stephen Fry as the de as the bait, but decrying the horrors of the of a free internet, mm. and this is the Daily Mail that makes most of its income off smut, which lives on the right hand column uh, of nude photographs, nude selfies. Just type in nude selfie Daily Mail into Google and see how many results come up, and tell me how many days you're going to spend looking at all those articles. And that's how the Daily Mail makes their money. So they're hardly in a position to be lecturing or printing anything, mm. lecturing about what's harmful uh, content for the Internet or how the Internet should be regulated or how they should sort of clamp down on uh, bloggers and things like this. Mm. So you can, see, you can see how the cartel is formed here, Mike. Celebrity, uh, high-level politics, and mainstream media all colluding together to create a narrative to basically bring us into the new brave new world. Uh, but but it's the Tories that want to bring us into that brave new world. I'm not hearing too much from the Labour Party at the moment about this type of crackdown. Uh, this, not to the degree that we're seeing from the Tories, this type of censorship, because that's what it is. We said after the in post Manchester, the agenda will be uh, an increase of the police state, uh, a reduction of uh, rights and, pro and expectation and privacy, and an increase uh, rhetoric about an increase of military operations overseas and to supposedly fight ISIS. And so this Daily Mail article is just basically proving one of those three legs that we said last week. Uh, and uh, the, the key point here is, of course, uh, Facebook and Twitter are accused of dragging their heels on ISIS content. But as we pointed out yesterday, ISIS content seems to be protected, whereas uh, alternative media, independent media content mm -hmm. seems to be being removed at ever greater amounts. Sure. Uh, what could be the explanation for that? Well, the, the, uh, this is a collusion between the highest levels of corporate media, the highest levels of politics, and uh, Silicon Valley, basically. The people who own Facebook, who own Twitter, these corporations. They're colluding to control the narrative uh, of everything in the news cycle, essentially. Uh, policing it themselves. 
telling us what's right, what's wrong. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, advocating protecting ISIS content online. But let me say, ISIS and, and Al Qaeda have been having a field day since 2011, all over social media and recruiting people, thousands of fighters through social media openly preaching hate openly uh, uh, against anybody who's not like them and advocating for, you know, murder, essentially, mass murder and genocide. Mm -hmm. So that's what our friends in the Silicon Valley have enabled over the last six years. Okay, thank you. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much to Patrick Henningsen. Thank you, Alex Thompson. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, we'll be back as usual at 1 p.m. tomorrow. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.